This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. We had all hoped, perhaps with naive hearts, that the brutal murder of George Floyd, the protests that followed, and the new expectations surrounding inclusion and anti-racism by the woke crowd would have meant the killing of Americans, especially of color, by police would have lessened if not been nearly eradicated. Sadly, predictably, 2022 saw a record number of police-involved killings. Already in 2023, there seems to have been a rash of incidents, One killing in Tacoma, Washington, was lost to the news cycle and the sheer number of incidents. Today, in part one of two, I'll be talking about just a few of the multiple officer-involved shootings so far this year. Next week, I'll tell the story of Emmanuel Ellis and his beating death from the spring of 2020. According to policescorecard.org, which is an amazing resource, by the way, they use data from police and sheriff's offices creating the website to share their findings. There is basically a thesis with the topics of police continue to hide substantial amounts of data from the public, policing differs substantially depending on where you live, police are making fewer arrests for low-level offenses, as arrests decline, racial disparities persist, black communities are more heavily policed, And 79% of jurisdictions increased police funding from 2013 to 2020. And Emily, you'll love this. There are maps showing your area and Uh the police departments therein. That's where I found these statistics for Portland. Based on population, a black person is three times as likely and a Latinx person is 0.5 times as likely to be killed by police as a white person in the Portland Police Bureau from 2013 to 2021. Of the 5,238 civilian complaints of police misconduct, 8% were ruled in favor of civilians from 2016 to 21. 128,357 arrests were made. 64% of all arrests were for low-level, nonviolent offenses. Before George Floyd's death and the subsequent viral video that, for many, was the moment they were radicalized, many Americans were either unaware of or unwilling to acknowledge the systemic racism within the police structure. By the spring of 2020, I was frustrated with police and horrified to see the weekly videos that would spring up on Instagram showing Philando Castile being shot in his car or having grown up through the Rodney King era. But I had never taken the time to fully dissect the history of the police and the damage they can truly inflict on entire communities. So we took to the streets. Portland was on the news a lot. We hoped that our outrage would force change, a change from higher up, a change from the grassroots communities that were working to show that we can take care of each other. Then things got quiet. Some of us tried to educate ourselves. Some of us stuck our heads back in the sand. It's been interesting to say the least and beyond frustrating for communities of color who felt a blip of support, which seems to have simply gone away. The most important message that was trying to be spread was, hey, can the cops stop killing everyone, especially people of color? That was 2020. That year, police killed 1,113 people. That summer, the marches screamed Black Lives Matter through the streets, through the internet, and even into personal relationships. Sadly, perhaps out of anger, revenge, or just the tension, Police killed 1,140 people the next year, during a pandemic, when people, for the most part, were staying home. They managed to still kill 27 more people than the year before. And last year, 2022, there were 1,185 officer-involved killings, an increase of 45 people from the previous year, 72 from 2020. And now, just a few weeks into 2023, we've already seen multiple police-involved shootings and beatings on the news. It's almost like our pleas of peace just push their violent pendulum into the opposite direction. I'm going to break our own rules here a little bit and leave the Pacific Northwest to talk about cases you may have seen in your social media feeds or on the news just from January of this year. After the protests of 2020, those who perceived them as riots felt there could be more training available to police for such scenarios. Atlanta, a city with those concerns, thought they had the answer. They would create what has been dubbed Cop City. 
Utilizing 90 million of mostly private corporate dollars, they would tear down over 100 acres of forest, which was backing up to a community of color, and build a high-tech training base. The militarized base had plans to develop spaces for explosive detonations, firing ranges, a Black Hawk helipad, a track to practice car chases, and in the city part of the development, hone their crowd control and raiding skills with training assistance from the Israeli police. There were also hopes that after so many cops quit in the aftermath of 2020, a neato playground like this would help not only in hiring, but retaining quality officers. Assuming the project will be seen through, it will be the largest training facility of this nature in the United States. Given the nature of Cop City and the amount of nature it would destroy in the South River Forest or Wilanui Forest, it is no surprise there were activists in the area. For about 18 months leading up to the incident of January 18th, a small group of Stop Cop City activists had taken to living in the forest. They built platforms and trees, camped out, blocked entrances to the forest, and have been accused of vandalizing equipment and even threatening the operators. For those protesting Cop City's creation, it wasn't just about being anti-police land or saving some trees. They were desperate to save the tall pines and oaks by making the area a park, as it would not only preserve Atlanta's vitally important tree canopy, but keeping them in place could minimize flooding as well. Stop Cop City, or SCC, soon became more than just campers protecting trees. They built a community where they shared food, clothes, money, and anything else as needed. Two of these protesters were Vienna and Tortuguita. Tortuguita, meaning little turtle, was not the birth name of Manuel Esteban Perez Terran, but it suited who they became as an activist. Tortuguita, a queer, non-binary, indigenous Venezuelan, happily lived in the Atlanta forest, perched in the tree through the summer and into the fall. In case they needed to provide medical care to their fellow protesters, Tortuguita took a 20-hour medical course. For those that knew and loved them, taking the initiative so they could help someone in need was exactly who they were. In December of last year, Tortuguita was interviewed by Bitter Southerner, where they said, quote, we get a lot of support from people who live here, and that's important because we win through nonviolence. We're not going to beat them at violence, but we can beat them in public opinion, in the courts even. That commitment to nonviolence is what has all of Tortuguita's family and friends shocked at what has been said to have transpired on the morning of January 18th, 2023. To clear the protesters, a SWAT team and the Georgia State Patrol arrived at the camp not long before 9 a.m. Finding Tortuguita in their tent, Officers gave the order for them to exit. They refused. After an exchange of some sort, the police claimed Tortuguita came out of their tent and fired a shot from a gun that they had purchased in 2020. A GSP officer was struck in the abdomen. He then fired back, shooting and killing 26-year-old Tortuguita. At the scene, seven protesters were arrested and charged with domestic terrorism, criminal trespass, and other miscellaneous charges. When fellow protesters heard of the death, Six of them refused to believe the version of events that were being told by police. They said their friend was so giving and helpful, it was nearly a fault. This was the person who was growing their hair out just to donate it to children with cancer. Even if they had a gun for protection, it wouldn't have been something they would have used aggressively. Looking over Tortuguita's life, you could understand what kind of caring person they were. Growing up in Venezuela, Aruba, London, Russia, Egypt, Panama, and the U.S., they had seen so much of the world and learned from that experience. They wanted to help others. So after graduating magna cum laude from Florida State University, they worked with Food Not Bombs, which aided in providing meals for those without. Those are all great things, but it doesn't mean a person couldn't have also done aggressive or harmful things. Like last December, when in another attempt to shoo the protesters out, Cops and firefighters were moving barricades when they were pelted with incendiary devices and rocks. Six protesters, including Vienna, were arrested for domestic terrorism. Those charges are pending. Tortuguita wasn't part of the charged in that incident, but could they have been taking part? Sure. Could those charges simply be part of a smear campaign of sorts? Absolutely. Marlon Kautz of the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, which is a group that provides legal aid to activists, said that the charges are, quote, purely being brought for the sake of putting activists in jail and demonizing the movement in the public eye. When we see authorities using the criminal justice system to chill speech and prevent activists associated with the movement, that is a grave threat to democracy. You may be thinking, this all sounds fishy and goes back and forth. You know it would clear everything up? A video. You'd be right. 
a video showing the altercation clearing up who shot first and for what reasons would answer almost all the questions. Well, there isn't any. Between a SWAT team and multiple GSP officers, they all claim that there is no body cam or dash cam footage of the interaction. That should be illegal. Shouldn't it, though? Even though there are photos of officers at the scene wearing body cameras. When you have a $90 million, mostly privately funded project being messed with by a handful of annoying protesters, it does seem odd that there wouldn't be any cameras when one of them is killed, especially when everyone present disagrees with the police's versions of events. All that is known is that the officer that was shot will recover, and the bullet recovered did come from Tortuga's handgun. But hold on. Just since writing, recording, and editing this episode, but before it was released, new information has surfaced. Police are still claiming that the bullet recovered from the officer's abdomen was from Tortuguita's handgun, but that might not be the case. It also appears that there is, in fact, at least some video from that day. It has since come out that witnesses said there didn't sound like there was any crossfire, just one type of gun or multiples of the same type firing, not a gunfight as was originally reported. As for the video, two hours of film from the day were released, none showing the shooting directly, but gunfire can be heard in the background. After the rapid fire shots, one officer asks, is this target practice? A particularly interesting snippet that has come from the body cam seems to, from the mouths of other officers at the scene, blame friendly fire for the officer's injuries. As the two officers listen to the radio calls regarding an officer being down, one says, man, you fucked your own officer up. It's said very casually, almost like, duh, that's what it sounds like happened. This not only contradicts what the police reported about the shooting, but it proves there was at least some video. GBI argues that someone making an assumption doesn't count as proof, which is true, but it is interesting to hear a professional overhear a radio conversation and come to that conclusion. I have a feeling there will be a lot more damning information to come from this situation. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation has assured Tortuguita's family and friends that they are impartial when it comes to officer-involved shooting investigations. This, of course, all led to more protests across the country, not just in response to the questionable interaction that led to Tortuguita's death, but to Cop City as a whole. The mayor of Atlanta said, quote, Make no mistake about it. These individuals meant to harm people. Tortuguita's brother, Daniel Paez, said that he and his family are heartbroken. Quote, Our family doesn't want violence towards cops, but we also don't want violence from cops. I'm just terrified at the thought that the tactics that were used to kill my sibling are going to be replicated at Cop City. I told my sibling, if you were ever to die, I'm going to dump oil and hazardous materials all over your stupid forest. They called my bluff. I care about the forest now. Their mother, Belkis Tehran, said, He was a privileged person, but he chose to be with the homeless, to be with the people that needed his caring. And that's a quote from mom is why it's gendered. Theirs will be an interesting case to follow. Will proof come out revealing who shot first? Will the story just get buried so Cop City can be completed? The night before recording the story, it was announced that via an independent autopsy, it showed that Tortuguita was shot 13 times by police. If only there had been video. That seems to have been the game changer of the last few years. For so long, only those in oppressed communities knew the depth of violence and corruption within their local police forces. We started to see more and more videos, like Eric Gardner in New York, who was placed in a deadly chokehold, launching widespread use of the I can't breathe as a call for reform. Long before that, there was the Rodney King video in which LAPD officers Stacey Kuhn, Lawrence Powell, Timothy Wind, Theodore Briesno, and Rolando Solano were caught on camera beating Rodney within an inch of his life. I was eight years old when that happened. It was on the news constantly. What I knew was there was a drunk man who had been in trouble for a robbery, and he tried to outrun the police. They caught up, and maybe he wasn't following directions or he was trying to hurt them, so they hit and kicked him. And I thought that for a long time, and I think many people, especially white, did. If you had just been following the rules, you wouldn't have faced consequences. An argument that is still heard today. Well, if they had just complied. Like in Tyree Nichols' case, in which he was given 71 commands in just 13 minutes. Impossible to follow commands like, get on the ground, as he lay on the ground. Show us your hands, as they held his hands behind his back. Tyree Nichols' case has gained national attention, and rightfully so. 
Here was this charming, talented, loving father who was returning home after taking photos of the sunset at a nearby park, someone whose smile seemed to glow, a hard contrast to the photo of him lying in the hospital bed, bruised and broken. It also proved that wearing cameras won't deter officers from being violent. Tyree's beating took place January 7, 2023. Tyree was eventually taken to the hospital where he succumbed to the fatal injuries he had suffered, injuries sustained by the police. As we waited to hear the real story, placeholder tales were leaked. In one report by some of the officers involved, they claimed the beating came after Tyree reached for multiple officers' weapons. Reports also stated the entire altercation began after Tyree was pulled over for reckless driving. And this is why cameras matter. Tyree never reached for any weapon. As more officials saw the horrifying video of the beating, they knew it was ugly, upsetting, and deserved to be protested against. That was because none of what officers claimed happened, happened. The chief of Memphis police, who is being hailed a hero for firing some of the officers involved, but has had issues like this in the past that were not dealt with. Additionally, she was the creator of the Scorpion Police Task Force, of which these officers were a part of, has said neither she nor anyone else involved has seen anything on a dash cam or otherwise that shows reckless driving or any behavior warranting Tyree being pulled over in the first place. Wow. Can you imagine your like your boss says that about you? <laughs> like, oh, you yeah. You just assume they're going to cover your ass. Yeah, because they always have. And yep. now you're like, oh, wait. Yeah, that's a really good point, too, of like suddenly uh, uh, higher up officers and chiefs are like oh yes this person screwed up well that's why when we need people to step forward because but you've trained them to think they'll get away with it yeah well i guess there's a line for everyone like that probably was shocking because he, he well he has actually he was excused from other things from that same chief so it's like wait what <laughs> you're against me now there have also been rumors swirling that perhaps Tyree and one of the officers involved had maybe worked together or dated the same woman, things to that effect. But none of that has been confirmed by anyone related to the case, so we are going to be ignoring those rumors until anything is confirmed. What is known is that at 8.24 p.m., Tyree was pulled over by members of the Scorpion team, a unit that was created with 50 officers who were dedicated to patrolling certain hot spots of neighborhoods in an effort to thwart crime via visibility. Scorpion officers weren't required to respond to dispatched requests for support, nor were they expected to conduct traffic stops. So it remains odd that the unit was involved in the first place. It's been said that pulling someone over was beneath Scorpion officers. What does SCORPION stand for? I assume it's an acronym. It is sort. an acronym. It is Street Crimes Operation to Restore Peace in Our Neighborhoods. Wow. Why didn't they use like a friendlier animal? Well. Slightly. You would think Seems that, that would Seems it's a little help. too on the nose. Yeah. No kidding. I also like picturing the people that had to decide this in an office, like what words can we Back use? patting each other. Yeah. And like, how do we make it into an acronym and how can we describe it? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, scorpion, a poisonous, unpleasant animal. <laughs> Within a minute of the stop, Tyree was physically pulled from his car. After he begged to the officers, he didn't do anything. One shouted, quote, get on the fucking ground. I'm going to tase your ass. As the officers use their best big boy military voices with weapons drawn, it's Tyree who was looking at them peacefully saying, calm down. I don't know how he was able to do that. I, I don't know either. It, it's almost zen-like. Well, because he, he's grown up his whole life mm -hmm. knowing he had to do that. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there were conversations like, you know, be polite and stay calm. It's so and... hard to watch um, videos that have surfaced of people teaching their kids. Mm-hmm. Like, we'll never understand what no. that's like. No. When I was tackled by only two cops after getting beanbag shot in the legs and I thought they were going to beat me, I remember holding out my hands and trying to show that I was being compliant, even though I had already been following their directions when they took me out. I was doused in my own pee and trying to keep myself from going into work mode of trying to restrain them to get them away from me. I just knew I needed to run as soon as I was out of their grip. I'm not a runner, but I knew that I would take off as far and fast as possible. I was terrified of being hurt, and I knew I wasn't doing anything illegal, so my survival instinct was screaming for me to get away from the danger. And this is coming from a white girl in Portland whose only negative interactions with cops before this was annoying traffic tickets. 
It opened my eyes to see just how terrifying an interaction with those who you thought were there to protect you can be. Sharing that story is in no way meant to compare it to the violence people of color face daily. I'm telling it in hopes that maybe it will open someone's eyes to how common this is and that you have no idea how terrifying those moments are until you're in them. You don't know how you would react in a similar situation, so you can't judge by saying things like, why is he running? Experiencing police violence once totally reshaped how I perceived cops. I walked into a friend's kitchen a few weeks ago and her officer husband was leaving for work. His full military-esque garb made my stomach turn and I shrunk to the size of a pea. So I cannot imagine what having an officer around must feel like for people in communities where they've lost people to police violence or false charges or they simply have to watch the financial or physical abuse take place daily. All of that is to say, I can't imagine what kind of fear Tyree, a young black man who hadn't done anything wrong, who was now looking at multiple types of weapons being pointed at him while nearly a dozen hands were maneuvering his body and half a dozen voices shouted unfollowable commands, was feeling. The demands continued. As one officer held an arm, another screamed for his arms to be behind his back. As he lay on the ground, not posing any kind of threat, a taser was held to his leg while they yelled, Lay down! After a struggle, Tyree was able to escape their hold, which might have some people saying, see, he was running away from the police, he deserved punishment, while others would be empathetic to the fact that some of the vehicles involved and the police were unmarked. Tyree knew he had done nothing wrong, and before he could process the words being said, he was being attacked. He was not naive as to what could happen to a young black man in that scenario, so he quite literally ran for his life. One officer, Preston Hemphill, the white guy who has only been relieved of duty, not yet fired or charged, whose body camera captured the first part of Tyree's interactions with the cops, didn't attempt to run after him. He simply shouted that he hoped they, quote, stomp his ass. Oh, my God. Catching up to and tackling Tyree, the officers doused his face in pepper spray while holding him to the ground. All the while, he continued to ask what he had done to warrant such treatment. They didn't have an answer. Luckily, there wasn't just body cam footage of what happened next, but there was also a camera on a pole just above them. And thank goodness there was, as the body cams alone could have been manipulated to paint a picture that matched their reports. But because of the aerial camera, everyone was able to see what really happened. After one of the officers said he was going to, quote, baton the fuck out of Tyree, he was kicked to the ground before a beating commenced. Kicks to the face, batons to his back, Standing Tyree up, the officers held his hands behind his back for three minutes, taking turns surrounding him and hitting him. And not just punching, beating. Haymakers, uppercuts, he was pummeled. For three minutes, Tyree was battered with his hands being held behind his back, unable to not only defend himself, but to protect his head and face. He was just yards from his mother's house, so Tyree did the only thing he could. He called out for his mama. At 8.37, the police tired, so the beating stopped and Tyree was handcuffed, limp, and barely responsive when they propped him up against a patrol car. As Tyree struggled to stay upright and to breathe, the officers, who had all had complaints lodged against them for previous incidents of violence, including from another young black man in the area that reported the Scorpion unit had beaten him just three days before they killed Tyree, then stood around bragging about what they had done how many hits they had landed, how hard they were hitting the 140-pound man. Tyree was six foot three, but only weighed 140 or so pounds due to Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease causes chronic inflammation of the GI tract. The inflammation can lead to fever, diarrhea, bloating, fatigue, and stomach pain, just to name a few of the symptoms. This, of course, has added questions. Why would it take five officers totaling over 1,000 pounds to subdue such a small man? If Tyree was still able to see through his swollen eyes at that point, he might have felt relief when the medical personnel arrived at 841. Sadly, they joined in the conversation and ignored the critically injured man for 16 minutes. Think about that. That's like nearly the length of a TV show without commercials. And he's just sitting there, dying, watching those who had taken oaths to serve, protect, and care for him laugh and mingle about what they had done, letting him die. Tyree was finally loaded into an ambulance and taken to the hospital as he was experiencing shortness of breath. It took three days for the internal injuries and bleeding to take his life. It was surprising for many to see two things. 
that the officers involved, at least some of them, were not only fired but charged with murder shockingly fast. Another surprise, that those five officers were black. This has spawned conversations about how policing is so rooted in white supremacy, even members of the community who are people of color can be used as tools for its advancement. James Baldwin said, Black policemen were another matter. We used to say, if you must call a policeman, for which we hardly ever did, for God's sake, try to make sure it's a white one. A black policeman could completely demolish you. He knew far more about you than a white policeman could, and you were without defenses before this black brother in uniform, whose entire reason for breathing seemed to be his hope to offer proof that, though he was black, he was not black like you. For now, we will have to wait and see what comes from all of this. Hopefully, those five officers will be held responsible and face serious prison sentences. Hopefully, the other officers and responding medics will do the same. If only hope were strong enough to create real change. Just before Tyree's death, there was another young man who was killed in Los Angeles, but his story slipped from the headlines. That man was Keenan Anderson. When it comes to videos of police brutality, I'm torn as I know a lot of people are. On one hand, you have people like us, white people mostly, who aren't exposed to this kind of behavior from police, and for many, seeing is believing. So maybe the video should be shared so that those who are in denial or are too privileged to know how things really are can be bombarded and horrified. On the other hand, is it so commonplace now? I wonder, are the videos just torture porn? Are they for people to watch who enjoy seeing a black person being brutalized? There's also the concern that by sharing the videos, we're forcing the trauma of state-sanctioned violence onto communities that don't need videos to know what's going on. I'm not an expert in any of this, so I don't know what the answers are. Sometimes the families want the videos shared so the true horror of what was done to their loved one can be known. Others don't want that to be how their child or spouse is seen by the world. Tyree was a photographer, skateboarder, father. He was a person, a multidimensional, complicated human like the rest of us. His life shouldn't be condensed to a video that will no doubt be doused with comments of how what happened was his fault. At the same time, each time one of those videos is shared, somebody's eyes open. It's true. To what's going on. Yeah, it's tough because Tyree's family did want the video released because they wanted everyone to know how awful it was. Well, because if we don't show them, people don't know how frequent this is happening. Right. Or how bad it is. If you say, oh, someone was beat up by police. Right. Like before, I know we lived through Rodney King. Mm-hmm. I remember it. And I I had no delusions about what was going on because my, my mom was from the Chicago area. Oh, yeah. I didn't have that. Grew up, you know, talking to me about that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people, that was their first with George Floyd. That was like their first first eye-opening experience yeah especially this younger generation yeah so while I totally understand and it's to me the family's prerogative like I I, it does a lot of good I think so and and I think it helps too like with Instagram having sensors you know so Mm -hmm. you can choose to see it or not because especially black communities it's like yeah we don't need to see that yeah they know what's going on I've seen it in person or I've had it happen to me or it happened to a family member like don't need to see it. Don't need to be reminded. But I'm torn on it, too, because it, it it does seem like you're exploiting them. Yeah. Uh, but how else can we fuel the younger generation and people to get mad enough and to, to fix know it? what's going on? I mean, truly, if they hadn't had that aerial cam, just watching the body cam footage, it's so chaotic and so up close. They could have said, oh, he was reaching for our guns. He was grabbing this. You can't see it. But right here he was grabbing. So-. And they could have said that and probably gotten away with it and if they hadn't had that aerial camera that probably would have been the case so yeah it's it's a tough one have you have you talked to chloe about cops in general or just safety in general or those kind of things yeah we talk about i mean i don't have to do that like people of color have to do that totally totally but i just mean the awareness like you with rodney king i didn't have that it was my my parents have grown a lot in the last yeah, actually, few years. And back then it was, oh, this guy was, it was never about race. It was just, oh, he was a drunk driver running away and they caught up to it. So it wasn't that it was okayed, but it certainly wasn't. We had an interesting conversation actually because she went with some friends to a, a trampoline place and a boy hit her. Um, and I, on the way there, I was like, do I need to call the cops? Do I need to press charges? Like what's happening? And then, she told me he was black and I was like, 
okay, let's talk about how serious this was because I was not going to get involved right. if it was um, if it was they were all excited and it was an accident. And so she explained right. what happened. And while I do believe what those boys were doing was inappropriate and someone should have intervened, he accidentally hit her. Oh. So I was like, I'm not going to. T-. And so I ex- had to explain to mm-hmm. her like w- my thought process there and, you know, kind of a little tidbit on disproportionate crime yeah. and all that stuff, you know. So we talk about it enough, I think, to her level. She's aware of it and she's aware that we live in a very white state in a very white neighborhood um, and she has friends that are black. So, you know, I'm like, talk to them with what they're comfortable sharing with you about their experience. And and so she, it's and like new checking in with them and being like, yeah. oh, that, that this news coming out might affect them differently than me. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, she's definitely aware and we watch. A, I think shows today, teenage shows tackle a lot of subjects. Oh, my that gosh. Introduce stuff. I am so impressed with some new TV and movies, especially horror movies that we've watched lately that are for younger people, not us old folks. And yeah, just how a variety of things, not just police violence, but just race and representation and all of that is kind of tackled within it. And even that's really uh, cool to that see. show Ginny and Georgia, they t- there's it's a white mom with a um, daughter. Her father's black and they they tackle how she feels so different and how her mom can't understand her because she's black and her mom's white, even though she's white too. Mm-hmm. It's like you're, she's it's different. pushing away that blackness to like fit her mom's life. And I just think that's a really good thing for yeah. kids to be exposed to early to start conversations. Yeah. In general, violence among males too, like they band together and they feed off each other's energy. Mm-hmm. Is Is it smart to have so many men working together on a, on a task force yeah a lot of former military men all that has no color to me like yes it may be based in this white supremacy like police creation but it has no color it's a violence and Mm -hmm. it's in our dna if you let it get to you yeah but at the same time like there are good cops there are good detectives there are good people out there and it's a matter of like how do we get rid of the bad i think a balance too because i don't want growing up how I did which was blind to it blind to it every cop is there to help you and they're you know sure. I, that's why I wanted to be a cop because you know in white communities they're like oh my gosh you decided to be a cop you're gonna risk your life you're it's amazing similar to being a woman and dealing with cops how many serial yeah. killers had this facade of like the trying to be a cop yeah <laughs> you exactly. know exactly yeah so just finding that balance of not wanting him to be paranoid but also that's a privilege because he's a white kid because I don't have to have that talk of that you would with with if you had a child. Of yeah, color. but you don't want to raise someone blind to it. Who's exactly. A lemming either. I yeah. get it. A similar video is that of the killing of Keenan Anderson. Around 3.30 p.m. on January 3rd, 2023, Keenan Anderson was visiting family in Los Angeles. He was off of work as he was a 10th grade English teacher at the Digital Pioneers Academy in Washington, D.C., and he was on winter break. His story gained attention when it was learned he was the cousin of Patrice Coolers, who was a founder of Black Lives Matter. The organization has since had issues of its own, but the sentiment remains Black Lives Matter. So when 31-year-old Keenan, the father to a six-year-old boy, was in a car accident in the Venice area, he did what anyone would do. He sought help. If you've ever been in any kind of traffic incident, from a fender bender to a serious crash, you know that the adrenaline in your body is running the show. From what I could find, the cause of the car accident is still unclear, although it is believed Keenan may have been at fault. In the body cam footage, where an officer is speaking with him, Keenan claims his car malfunctioned and he had a tire that needed air, and he's clearly confused and concerned. Preliminary toxicology reports, done only by the police themselves and not an outside testing facility, claim to have shown trace amounts of weed and cocaine in Keenan's system. Not only has that not been confirmed by secondary testing, but many are concerned that the police are reporting that as a blame factor. Here we have a black man coked up who maybe went berserk and needed to be handled. Supporters claim that the trace amounts could have been left in his system from days prior. When you watch the video, sure, Keenan seems kind of off, but first of all, I don't know the guy. I don't know what he was usually like. Secondly, he was just in some sort of accident. Now he has the police with him, and it's clear that he's anxious. After he flagged down the police, they started talking to him about what happened, what his name was, where his ID was, etc. 
Perhaps Keenan realized he was talking with an LAPD officer and he was scared that they were either going to hurt him or he would be arrested as they were sending out a DUI team to investigate. So he asked for a lawyer. The officer scoffed at the idea and continued speaking with him. As an onlooker shouted that he'll be okay because they were watching him, the fear of the situation he was in seemed to have hit him. There's no way to know what he was thinking in that moment, but he stands up and starts to back away. The officers would later say he was acting erratic, running in the streets, but what it looks to me is someone that's running away from danger. At some point, Keenan mutters something about people trying to kill him. A few minutes later, when the officer brings up that subject, Keenan says over and over that he no longer has those concerns, or perhaps they were misunderstood in the first place. For all we know, he could have been talking about his own car trying to kill him or the other driver in the accident. After being placed on a wall by the first officer, Keenan gets up and starts walking closer to the street, saying that he wants people to be able to see him. He then walks into the street, watching the officer, before running through an intersection and ending up between cars. The original officer followed him on his motorcycle, and soon a gaggle of officers were on top of Keenan. He asked for help, then walked away. They had his car and ID, so it wasn't like he couldn't be tracked down if he was needing to be charged for something later. As they approached, giving the orders for him to lay on his stomach, you can see that he's contemplating. He slightly turned his body to lay down, but he also looked like he was debating on whether or not to run. He was in a position of, if they're trying to kill me, I should run. But if I do, will I just get shot in the back? Once he was pinned down into the street, two officers held him down, one of which had his elbow in Keenan's neck and a knee in his back. He was then handcuffed and his legs were shackled. Another officer took out a taser and, while holding down the handcuffed man, shot the taser into Keenan's back. I'll never understand using a taser when somebody's already subdued. His legs were shackled. Where is he going? I, I just don't get it. You what had it he done that time. was harmful? I mean, the car accident, okay, but... But he's already, you already have him. Yeah. He's subdued. There yeah. is no need to pull a taser out. That makes more sense when they're like getting up and running away from you. Or running at you. Right. Yeah. I'll, I just, I'll, it's not, it's not forgivable to me. Yeah. I'll, I just don't get it. My favorite holiday of the year is just around the corner. Valentine's Day? Uh, my birthday, duh. And when it comes to Valentine's Day slash the sacred day of my birth, nothing hits the spot like candy. But of course, this year I'm off the sugary stuff, so thank goodness for Native. I'm loving Native's new limited edition candy shop collection. Like all Native products, they are thoughtfully formulated to keep me feeling and smelling deliciously fresh all day long. You know Native for their aluminum-free deodorant. Native keeps their ingredients list bare naked using only coconut oil, shea butter, milk of magnesia, and baking soda, which means it's safe for you and your skin, even if it's sensitive. Native deodorant offers 72-hour odor protection, naturally derived ingredients, and a smooth, residue-free application with an array of scents to choose from. The new limited edition candy shop collection includes four new scents, gummy bears, strawberry and vanilla taffy, sour berry belt, and sweet cinnamon hearts. Normally, I'm all about the eucalyptus and mint scent, but I think I'm going to have to switch it up because the sour berry belt is sweet and tangy, just like me. I'm all about the strawberry and vanilla taffy. It smells just like the real thing. Delicious. This Valentine's Day, you can be the sweet treat with Native. Right now, go to nativedo.com slash rain or use promo code rain at checkout to get a sweet 20% off your first order. That's nativedo.com slash rain or use promo code rain at checkout for 20% off your first order. We may be on the other side of the holiday season, but that doesn't mean we can't find reasons to celebrate. There's Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, engagement parties, retirement celebrations, Mondays, Fridays. Another thing to celebrate, we are living in 2023, a time when those libations that add to celebrations can be delivered to your door. No more missing out on jokes or games because you had to get more wine. No more putting on pants to leave your house while in the middle of binging a show. In less than an hour, Drizzly can have beer, wine, and spirits delivered to your home. Simply use the number one alcohol delivery app, Drizzly. 
place your order, and boom, start that next episode and you'll be enjoying a beverage before it's over. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com and get your favorite drinks delivered today. Turning the electricity on and off, Keenan was shocked for long stretches of time over a 90-second period, the longest stretch being a 30-second shock without a break. Oh, my God. As all of this happened, Keenan yelled out, They're going to kill me. They're trying to George Floyd me. He knew. The caveman instinct for survival had taken over. Keenan had realized before a hand was laid on him that he was in danger, hence trying to leave the scene. Maybe he was walking away subconsciously no different than an experienced hiker would with a bear. With every slight movement, probably just trying to seek comfort while laying in the street with men on top of him and a taser in his back, the officers continued to yell, stop resisting. After all of that electricity, Keenan was taken to the hospital where he died a few hours later from cardiac arrest. The family's lawyer, Carl Douglas, has said, quote, If you tase someone with 50,000 watts of electrical energy six times in the heart, is there really any wonder that moments later his heart would begin to flutter? Is there really any wonder that moments later his heart would begin to beat erratically? And is there any wonder why four hours later his heart could no longer withstand the pressure from that taser and gave out? Some might say that the cocaine, that again hasn't been proven with secondary testing, wouldn't have caused his death and traces of it can stay in your body for days. The outcome of Keenan's case is yet to be known. The officers involved have been put on immediate leave. I'm not sure if it's paid or not, but I would assume that it's paid. His family has filed a $50 million lawsuit against the LAPD, which they can definitely afford as they received $1.8 billion, with a B, dollars last year, which was 29 times higher than the city of Los Angeles' housing budget. The LAPD couldn't dwell on Keenan's situation too long, as the second of three officer-involved deaths in just that first week of the year was taking place at the same time. At 4.45 p.m., less than two hours before the confrontation with Keenan began and less than 20 miles to the west, police arrived to the area of Central Avenue and 28th Street. The call they were responding to was about a man who was having a mental health crisis. He was standing on the side of the road throwing metal objects at passing vehicles. When one person got out of their car after it was struck, the man threatened them with a knife, hence a call to 911. Arriving to the area, police found the man, 35-year-old Oscar Sanchez. His family wasn't surprised to hear of his erratic behavior. Oscar had been struggling with a major depressive disorder that had only heightened after his mother passed away three years ago. Officers approached Oscar, who was then holding a metal pipe and was walking around a property of an abandoned building. Oscar then went up a set of outdoor stairs to the second floor and entered an open room. While continuing to hold the pipe, officers realized that there was a three-inch spike of some sort at the end of it. They yelled English orders to a Spanish-speaking man in crisis. Without making a plan of what the next step would be, some officers fired non-lethal rounds, others chose bullets. Oscar was struck and fell to the floor. Claiming medics couldn't have helped him in the confined space, they handcuffed the dying, bleeding man and carried him down the stairs. Oscar died at the hospital. All of these stories and videos are upsetting. Oscar's especially made me upset. Watching the police interact with this man for mere seconds before shooting had me viscerally reacting with fucking cowards. Here you have a group of large, trained men dressed head to toe in military gear with an array of weapons, vests, shields, all up against a young man, alone, scared, unwell, and unarmed, except for a pole. Do you know what I was protected by when I worked in mental health facilities? I guess my denim jeans and Kevlar sleeves. Do you know what kind of weapons I faced? The same. Unwell, sometimes very strong kids who were holding up desks, rulers, scissors, pens. The weapons I had? My training and my team. No shields, no tasers. For my team and myself then, and for everyone who works in mental health facilities, hospitals, or similar settings now, that's all you have to work with. When a large person holding a dangerous object starts charging at you, you can't reach for less lethal rounds. You can't freak out and shoot someone to stop them when you're scared. You're forced to face the situation as it is, all while remembering you can't just go wild on the patient to protect yourself. There are steps, protocols, cameras, paperwork, 
Not to mention, you don't take that kind of job so you can have those options. And to be honest, if I had been allowed to have a weapon in those situations, I can almost guarantee the fear would have taken over and people would have been harmed. There must be a comfort in knowing that you will always win. You will always end a confrontation, not by de-escalation, but by bringing the crisis to an abrupt end. Nurses, certified mental health providers on all levels, third-party security officers, anyone else who has a job requiring them to be in the same level of danger as police but without the uniform protection or weapons, knows that de-escalation through talking, taking time, and patience is possible. They also know training for police should focus on that instead of a firing range in Cop City. Or it isn't in the control of police. Like, we see so many jobs that are specialized to deal Mm -hmm. with something, and you don't ask that one person who has that special skill set to take on 20 new skills. Exactly. You create another specialist. Exactly. So it doesn't have to be one underpaid dude who has to learn a million skills. Exactly. Well, it's like our Portland's mental health team. They had huge results last year. They were called to scenarios like this where it's not necessarily that you need the police there. Like, okay, he was throwing things at cars. That's illegal, but that's not the top priority. It's safety. Or the police see the situation and then call in their specialists to help them. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think we all see it as a future option. The question is, how long is it going to take to get to that scenario? Well, and to recognize that that's it. I mean, we're talking, like you said, You've got a group of mostly men, mostly alpha males, mostly former military. The things you have to do in de-escalation practice is probably looked at as being really soft and fuzzy. What, having empathy? Yeah. I mean, I, I know that's kind of a joke, but yeah. Yeah. Having empathy, being able to say, hey, what's going on with you? What has happened to you? What are you needing? Instead of, I'm coming into a situation where I'm the villain and they're going to come after me. So I just have to stop them until I get them in control. I think people are starting to realize that people higher up that can make those choices. But um, as you'll see in a in a moment here, even with those things in place, like mental health support and teams like that, it doesn't always get utilized. I'd be I'd be really curious to see like a police, like an entrance exam or a application or whatever to see what percent of the focus is on like empathy it's probably like one percent yeah well a couple years ago when my brother was still trying to be an officer he was told he wasn't militaristic enough even though he had worked in mental health and he had worked in search and rescue and he had worked with kids and he had done all these things that would have provided that side you know i have a friend who just became a police officer about a year and a half ago and i will ask him about yeah, that'd be interesting. That process. And he is former military, so it'll be an interesting take to hear yeah. from him. But I will be happy to talk to him about that. Yeah. And on one hand, that makes sense to have military guys. Like, they're going to follow directions. They're going to... Well, and he's high pressure, uh, very trained. Like, like, right. He's somebody they could really use for sure. But it, it does make you think, like, are there other types of people they look for to kind of balance that too? Right. I don't think so. Yeah. But it should be. It should be a, a wide variety of types of people that are different mm-hmm. types of police. Yeah, because you're not coming into a war zone. Like the military yeah. stuff is great for handling your guns, knowing how to wear a uniform and falling into line. Well, they did have an active shooter in Bend this year. So people like him came real handy, I yeah. would say. But and right. sadly, that's needed, too. But it's not all that's needed. Sure. You, you no, can't I, take yeah. you totally can't agree. Just like, yeah. you can't take that rigid thinking and place it in front of someone who's yelling, holding a pole. Well, like I said, even in a business, you have different types of people yeah. to do different jobs, but they all work together to make the company work. Why can't this be the same? Yeah. Yeah. If you give someone a gun, they're gonna they're gonna use it. To me, it feels like police like first response yeah. is like a gun. It's right like it's just right there. Cowboy style bullshit. They've yeah. done studies uh, where I God, well, there's a show on Netflix, I think, that covered it, but where people reach for their gun and shoot before assessing the situation. So mm. there there's a lot of training that needs to go into that because you're faster. You work faster to pull that out than your brain can actually exactly. process what's happening. There was somebody I saw online and she had been through several different police and similar trainings. And she said that one of the top things they say is if you're firing your weapon, you yell, drop your weapon, because witnesses won't be able to remember the order. 
makes. So that's what we're up against. Or the guy who said training his cops and he said, well, if you cripple somebody, they're going to sue uh, for forever and it's going to be a huge ordeal. But if you kill somebody, three million makes the family go away. That's disgusting. And that's their training. Now, when you look into these things, did you run across areas where the statistics was far less, where they are seeing improvements based on maybe a new style or somebody new in charge? Last year of the top 100 cities and top, I mean, like by size, only one of them didn't have an officer involved shooting. That's some of it. I didn't go as deep as your question. I would just love to see someone in charge do something totally different. Like maybe they have private funds that allow them to do so. I have heard of a couple like smaller towns where they are like, oh, we got rid of our police force or we limited it or we took away guns from the cops and it has helped and those things have been proven. But when you're getting almost two billion dollars. Right. But the more of that that can be visible to the public and seeing the stats of how it is better. And well, that's improved. what we're here for, baby. <laughs> To say it's okay, it's okay to say let's look at other options. It's not working, and like we've said before, this is also for the police. Like you said, it's like it shouldn't be that the guy who you know pulled you over for your headlight being out also then goes to a house fire, also then goes and is the first one yeah. at a murder scene, or chasing a robber. Like it you can't be, be good at divided. everything, and we're human. We make mistakes. Yeah. So the more specialized you are, the better. Yeah. Especially if you're given the like the ultimate responsibility of being able to choose whether or not to kill somebody mm-hmm. in, in an incident like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the systemic stuff. That's the cycle. That's the, like you said, the boss, you know, you've never had your boss condemn your work. Your boss always covers you up or says, oh, it's cheaper. Just pay the family three million. And then you get all of your gadgets from the taxpayers and you're like, oh, this is cool. We have a tank now. We have full military clothing, whatever. We're the scorpions. We're the scorpions. We don't have to go to those calls. We're untouchable. And it feeds into itself. And that's the issue. That's what the systemic stuff is. It's what it's built upon going all the way back to the beginning of policing. It's it's what its purpose is and and what it comes from. I feel like I've seen those those types of law enforcement units become gangs. Yes. A lot. Oh, yeah. They get arrested for like drug trafficking, human trafficking because yeah. they're all in that world. And then, yeah, it's like doing their own policing, their well, own kind of policing. And yeah. if you look at them as individuals, they aren't making a ton of money so when you right. it is easy to corrupt someone mm-hmm. who's like a struggling father of three who has a stay-at-home wife be like oh for a little bit more money you just have to like not tell anyone about this like yeah, what are you gonna do happens. call the police yeah there was a video just i think two months ago of two officers that went into a house and they found like five grand they, in cash they offered to split the money yeah they were yeah, like oh that. let's split it if you're standing there watching that happen who do you call Especially if you're low income, especially if you're of color, especially if you have any kind of criminal history. You either history. submit it anonymously or you just go along with it because. And the boss what is going to say, what? We're going to go after them? No way. That's why we, we see it in the news like these big busts of like police c- corruption uh, working with like drug lords mm-hmm. because they're making money that they cannot get from the government. Yeah. So it is a wider problem. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> yeah. Again, you hear it a lot when these videos come out from people in every kind of position, whether you're, you know, a residential care facility or just us, any kind of school. We have schools that teachers are getting shot, you know, anywhere where you're dealing with mentally unwell people or weapons or anything. <laughs> in writing this, I went back to like my worst restraint ever. I was by myself. The kid was had a good 30 pounds on me and my radio had been thrown. And so I didn't have any support and and I had to hold him incorrectly it was not a good hold and I was had to you know just scream out for help so that he wouldn't hurt kids in the hallway and and I look back at that moment and just think yeah if I had had a taser he would have been hurt you know and I think when these videos come out you have all these people that face these same things obviously there's a difference between a child and obviously there's a difference between an adult man who's maybe on some kind of drug or Mm -hmm. something that's altering his his mind and his body 
many people face the same things cops face every day and they don't have those options and that's not part of it. De-escalating a situation was like the best feeling. It was like, woo, high five. Oh my God. Like I did that. So it just makes you think a lot. It's just why, why is it we expect nurses and teachers to handle these situations, but cops mm-hmm. can just shoot someone? Yeah, that's a that's a good way to put it. You have teachers dealing with violent kids or nurses dealing with all sorts of people on drugs. Yeah. Who knows what? And they don't have a weapon. Yeah. And you don't have that choice. You can't. Not even that. But like I if I was being attacked many of and pick any situation in which that was happening you know I'm trying to think of the time that the kid had his entire hand had my hair and was like walloping on my face I'm blocking and I'm trying to block him even though my brain is like we'll just get rid of like knock him out like stop the threat and you have to work through that to right. be like no I'm blocking your hand and I'm making but sure that takes training exactly but it's like you can't be in that position of I have to defend myself and it's a weird place to be and it's a weird thing to do to your brain but that's the job that's what it should be so even with new body camera laws and the knowledge that the videos of incidents will be released cameras don't appear to be having an effect on officers there doesn't seem to be a moment where they think if the world sees this will they think I've done the right thing but that doesn't always matter I can't find any information about the officers involved in the killing of Oscar Sanchez, with the exception of the few, I believe, mandatory days after being involved in a shooting. I don't think Diego Barcamontes or Christopher Guerrero were put on any kind of leave. I'm guessing the LAPD is hoping the three homicides that took place within 48 hours of each other in the first few days of the year will just go away. That's right. Three homicides. Like Portland, Los Angeles has a mental health response team. Its job is to do what the cops haven't been proven to have the ability to do, de-escalate situations and work with the people in crisis. In all three incidents, which would have been acceptable situations to use the team, it was not called. In fact, on January 2nd, the police weren't called either. Shamika Smith walked to the LAPD's Rampart Division station. As a black woman, she knew that just calling the police could lead to a dangerous interaction. So when her estranged husband, 44-year-old Takar Smith, showed up at her house, which broke the restraining order she had against him, she filmed him. The video showed a man who had been diagnosed with schizophrenia six years prior having a mental health crisis. After getting the footage, she went to the station so she could talk to someone and explain what was going on, that she cared for her husband, but he was needing help. The last thing she wanted to do was call 911 about a black man acting erratic, which could lead to a big shootout, as is so often seen. At the police station, officers gave Shamika a phone number to call. It wasn't the mental health team. It was an 877 emergency number, perhaps listed as non-emergency, but there is a recording that shows it was 911. Is he black, white, Hispanic, or Asian? Yes, he's black. How old is he? He's 44. 44. And what's his name? His name is Takar Smith. Like, um, he needs to go okay. back to one of those facilities, I okay. think. What, what, how do you spell his first name? Um, T-A-K-A-R. Okay. And what color shirt and pants are you wearing? Um, he got a white, well, um, he probably changed. So he got a blue, a blue, um, blue sweats and a blue shirt, but he's inside, like, inside the unit. Okay. And is this a house, an apartment, or business? Yes, this is an apartment. Okay. And you're on your way back home? Yeah, I'm already here. Um, I'm here already yeah. around the corner. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, is there an access code to get into the building? In, into the building there, the apartment? What you say? Is it aware? Is there an access code? Like, do you have to dial anything to get in, or is it open for officers to walk in? No, um, I, I, um, dang, because he took my keys. I don't even have my keys, but I will have to let the police in the gate. But so I'm going to stay open, like the You can open the door for the officers? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, um, would they, would they be able to call me uh, when they come? Yes. yes, ma'am. Okay, um, is there a history of domestic violence between you and him? Yes, a lot, like, oh, really. Did you have any weapons yes. that you saw? Um, a knife, he probably grabbed a knife, because he already said he ain't going back to jail. So it sounds like he's going to try to fight the police, but uh, he, he's not in his right so mind. He said, like, he's okay, <laughs> okay, ma'am, so he, 
You saw him with the knife, or do you are you assuming he grabbed the knife from the apartment? Um, I'm assuming that's what he's going to grab. Okay. Did he say he was going to fight the police? Yeah, he said, he said, call the police. I don't care. He said, I'm not going back to jail. He said, I'm going to fight everybody. I'm going to fight them too. Like, you know, but he's not in his right mind. Okay. Is he diagnosed with any mental illness? Yes. What is he diagnosed it's with? Um, 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 schizophrenic. Do you know if he's taking his medication? No, he hasn't. Um, he, he, cause he said nothing wrong with him. Okay. All right, I'm but I'll tell you, um, if you, you if you look him, can you see that he's been in a um in a? I don't have access to that. I don't have access to that. I I cannot look up anyone like that. Give me one oh, moment. Okay. Hold on. Okay, hold on. After Shamika calmly explained she was concerned as Takar was off his medication and was saying outrageous things like he wouldn't be going back to jail, it makes you wonder what was dispatched to the police. Were his threats just written out, causing police to go into defensive mode, or was the information shared that he was unmedicated? Arriving at the apartment, Takar opens the door for the police, but he asks to get his shoes on first. When police make their way inside, he says over and over, don't do all that, don't do all that. Again, watching the video is not only heartbreaking, but so frustrating. Why would you walk towards an agitated person while sternly saying, relax? That's an, that's awful, even for people who aren't unmedicated and Imagine when you're feeling frustrated and someone just goes, relax, okay? That's like my least favorite there when somebody's like, calm down. Yeah. It's like, shut the hell up. Yeah. That's for, that's like, I think 99.9% of people. Yeah. When no you're upset, hear that. don't say relax. Is that ever going to help someone relax? Yeah. No kidding. I feel like that's like the ultimate sitcom joke, you know? Don't tell your wife to relax. You'll only make it worse. You know your marriage is going south when that starts happening. Exactly. So it's <laughs> like, hey, let's implement that into like everything. The police present pushed Takar further into his home. When an officer said, hey, don't grab anything, Takar then of course grabbed something, a small wooden dining chair. With the lifting of a wooden chair, the officers escalate the situation by turning on their lights and holding up tasers. Takar looks like a deer in headlights with red dots swirling around his chest. Saying they don't want to tase him and they just want to talk to him outside, the officers seem to multiply and continue to walk towards Takar. He then grabbed a cup and went into the kitchen to get some water out of the fridge. As he poured water from a jug, the officers discussed who had lethal. Takar continued to ask them to stop all that. As the requests for him to put on his shoes and to talk with them outside continued, Takar got more and more upset, demanding that they just talk right there. When he spotted the gun pointed at him, he began to speak in an unintelligible language. Ten minutes into their interaction, Takar put his shoes on. Hoping to get out of the apartment, the whole group started to head for the door. Between the kitchen and the living room, Takar stopped. He was clearly annoyed with the officer and how they were speaking with him. So after 15 minutes of repetitive, come with me, let's talk outside directions, Takar then ran the few feet back to the kitchen where he rifled through some dishes before brandishing a knife. He quickly set the knife on the counter and all tasers were drawn. The threat of being tased not affecting Takar as he said he thought that they had already tased him in the living room, which I think paints a pretty good picture of his mental state at the time. Still holding his cup of water, Takar says they will be there all day. The police started talking about the two bikes that were stored in the kitchen, and they had been knocked over in the process of Takar running through. Officers told him to stop playing childish games and to be an adult. Takar responded by saying a list of names, Mrs. Clinky, Mrs. Marco, and others, who were telling the police to leave right now. In What Not to Do When Dealing with Someone in This Condition 101, the officers then decide to move one of the bikes that was in front of Takar. This, of course, brought his attention to the bikes. He then grabbed the adult-sized bike with one hand and lifted it up towards the officers. So he wasn't throwing it, just kind of made it go closer to them. One officer then tased him. He seemed unaffected, saying, Who am I now? Takar reached for the knife. More tasers were shot, along with some pepper spray. He curled up, falling to the floor. With two bikes between the man who was being tased and the cops, they felt they were in mortal danger when Takar reached to the floor and again picked up the knife. He was on his knees, on the floor, facing a cabinet, two bikes between them, but because he grabbed a knife and lifted it over his head, 
they shot him multiple times. His body only continued to move as long as he was being tased. Charges against those officers have yet to be filed. The DA has watched the video but is waiting to get the results of the investigation before making that decision. Newly elected L.A. Mayor Karen Bass said, Full investigations are underway, and I pledge that the city's investigations into these deaths will be transparent and will reflect the values of Los Angeles. I will ensure that the city's investigations will drive only towards truth and accountability. Furthermore, the officers involved must be placed on immediate leave. Shamika, who had reached out to the police to get her husband help but was left mourning the father of six, said, They really failed me. I never knew that going to the police, they would not help me, and they just let me down, and I'm just so hurt. My husband was a great man. He just needed help. His mother said, he needed help. He just needed help. And that's what they were supposed to come and do, not shoot him down like that. His family intends to file a lawsuit. It's just heartbreaking because she tried so hard Mm -hmm. to do it in a way that would result in no one getting hurt. And because of a reliance to go through the police to get like a mental health Mm -hmm. task force, we need to like put that in the community's hands where they know where to go to because people with family members who have mental illness, this happens. They go through these things. Yeah. And we shouldn't have to rely on police for that if it's just going to result in more deaths. Getting mental health should be as easy as calling 911. It should be. Yeah. A mental health, fire, medical mental health. And let me say, mental health, please. And then send that team out. Maybe they have an officer that comes with them to wait in the car in case things get really unsafe or something. Mm-hmm. But it would just yeah, like it would pair. reduce it so drastically. It's like hostage situations. You don't just rely on some officer to deescalate those. There's a, someone who does that. Yeah. And they work with them. It's no different. Yeah. I think if that was available to people this would happen less and less. Oh, by so far. You know, there's probably plenty of officers who don't know that there's a different way that they could do it. That's true. And and I get it. Like, I can be fair here and say, I get that police are killed on duty. I get that people brandish weapons like guns at police. This isn't about that. This is, well, number one, that comes from interaction for the most part. So that's why people are saying, why are cops even doing traffic stops? Why do we need to have people on both ends risking their life because your registration's old or because a brake light is out? Like, can't that be handled a different way? Another way. We have so much technology at our fingerprints. Yeah, like, oh, I saw it. So I marked fingertips. (laughs) Exactly. Somewhere. Like, why can't an officer say, oh, I saw that and I sent the, the license to the DMV and now they're sending a letter or something? There can be other ways. I do think we'll get to more of that. In I would the hope future. so. And so it's like, so eliminate the interactions, which brings the danger for both sides down and have those other resources available and have that training. Because if all you hear is all cops are bastards and everybody's after the cops and everyone hates cops and civil uprising, whatever it is, and you have a lot of cops that have been found to be part of groups, uh, you know, Proud Boys and QAnon and all of that. And it's like you're going into a situation where you are and you're the bad guy because you're coming to arrest somebody. So you're going into a situation where you're already on the defense. Mm -hmm. If one thing goes wrong. I think that's an important stance to take is that it's not they're all bad. It's just there's a lot of like education and training and other ways to do things that aren't being explored. Right. And it's to protect both sides. Right. I, you know, I don't want to be labeled as anti-police because I'm not. Right. I, but I'm also not a person of color. Right. And I'm and I don't have guns and I don't break the law. Right. So I, I I'm not coming into contact with it and I see it and I empathize. I don't know what that's like. Right. I want it to be better. Well, and I think that's the point is the whole thing. It's kind of like the one bad apple ruins the bunch. Yeah. If that person is still having a job, if if you work in that yes. situation, if your boss is saying at a training that it's cheaper to kill somebody than to wound them. I mean, I wouldn't work there. But that's the point. And, <laughs> exactly. that, and that's where the, that's where the all cops issue comes in is because like who did anyone report that guy? Did the video get leaked from another officer or did everyone just sit there and go like, oh, OK, OK. Now, that doesn't mean that that officer went out and shot somebody or he's going to go out and shoot somebody. 
but you're compliant. And now it's in your head that it will there will be no consequence to if you do it. Yeah. And you're allowing those theories and feelings to exist within your workplace. You're still in a system like until all police can say, like, I recognize police were built out of slavery and catching enslaved people until yeah. that's acknowledged and change starts coming. It's like for me and I get that you're not on this train. For me, it is all cops until all it's all the, the institution until those to you. good cops come forward to say we're no longer going to carry guns or we're no longer going to do this or we're until those good ones come forward. For me, it, it is all of them. It's just hard to pay money, pay an obscene amount of money to groups that don't need it when people that do need it, which would lower crime, aren't getting that money. And it's just used to militarize and create more dangerous situations. It's just heartbreaking. And these were these were hard to watch and and so frustrating to write about and just and and I wish I understood everything more. I wish I understood abolition more. I wish I Yeah. It just sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's devastating. It sucks. It really that... is. And it's one of those problems that it's like it seems like there is no end in sight because there's so much that needs to happen yeah. and you need everyone on board to do it or the majority on board to do it. Yeah. And we just see it happening. And I, I saw a really great, you know, it always comes back to TikTok. I saw a really <laughs> great TikTok video of a guy, you know, often somebody will do a video where they're like two people having a conversation. And it was this topic about how everything is connected, how being black, you are more likely to get shot in a, in a traffic violation. This, that, and this. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Oh, they're born into poverty. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Because they're they're not that far from slavery, mm -hmm. right? There are only so many generations. Like, it's so sad. And when you put it that way, I think people understand disproportionate. Like, you right. did that episode. They understand it. But it is so many people out there that don't. Yeah. Don't get it. Don't. It's not their problem. They don't care. Yeah. And that's just so hard to swallow and mm -hmm. think about because nothing can be fixed by just one thing. Exactly. Yeah. Like that money in L.A. It's like, OK, so how how much could you have cut that two billion dollars down by? And if you did reinvest that in housing or vouchers for people or whatever those people were needing or mental health care, medication, uh, substance abuse support, how much better mm -hmm. would our society be if all the money put into cops was put into education, health care, and just back food into security, food, food security? Yeah, exactly. We have police departments with tanks, but we have kids that go to bed hungry. Mm -hmm. How does that work? And what is going to happen to those kids as they get older? Exactly. Exactly. It's and just it's, a cycle. And it is so many things. It's it's gun availability for people which makes cops think everyone has a gun when maybe it's just a pipe or a bike it, it's too much to tackle here and i wish i was some sort of academic on it for now we don't have the answers but i just wanted to share those stories because there are so many of them it's hard to keep track and just watching a you know seeing a clip of something doesn't really tell the story and and i wanted to s say more about these people than just how they were killed by the police. I wanted to explain who they were as fathers, as as people struggling. You know, I, I know people who lose a parent and have a really hard time and, or it does amplify mental health issues they have. That happens. And that doesn't mean that you're supposed to have a death sentence at the hand of cops. So, Nope. You think you could count on humanity to help you recover. Exactly. And that I think that's another, you know, some people will say, oh, I'm here for true crime to like, you know, relax and listen to a story. But it, it's this is true crime. Mm -hmm. This is real time true crime. Yeah. That's happening to people that may be different than us. Yeah. And, and like you said, having people from different walks of life. Imagine if you had like a former sex worker working a task force to like support sex workers mm -hmm. or you had former people or and people that, they, there are there are right but i mean you know but widely yeah. yeah or like people that have struggled or at least worked in mental health mm -hmm. then you know become an officer of sorts because 
Well, we'll be sending that. that military guy to the door of the guy who's having the mental health crisis. That's not going to match. We up. see that a lot with counselors and therapists. People yeah. who have been through the struggle mm-hmm. can then help others. It would be nice to see that expanded to this type of thing. Yeah, too. you're right. Imagine going to like a rehab facility and being like, oh, I have an issue. I have an addiction. And your counselor is like, fantastic. I did eight years in Afghanistan. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, like, Doesn't hey, compute. that's great. And you must have like a lot of talents and skills. But like, if you can't relate to me where I'm at, how are we ever going to problem solve that? Next week, I will share the story of Manuel Ellis, a Tacoma man who was walking home from 7-Eleven when he was brutally and fatally beaten by police. Cade, and now I realize my solitaire was part of that. And now I'm going to have to play, pay for it again because I no. want to play it. <laughs> Did you lose all your scores? It's okay. No! no! Wow, yes, wow, it wow, saved wow, my wow. games. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there is a God. Thank goodness. <laughs> Praise be. I mean, you do what you got to do to get what you want, I guess. Fucker. That's fucked up. You're getting money off of something that yeah. your victim can't yeah, do anything about. That's very true. Ew, yeah. The statute of limitations is yep. like lifted so he can make money off of it. Yep. Ah! <laughs> this world. And you start it with, I'm Alicia Holland. Stop treading on me. And this, this is, is Alicia my case. <laughs> All emails can be sent to <laughs> Alicia Holland. Alicia Joy, 66. Rocker Chicka 66 at, hot, <laughs> at hotmail.com. Oh, Jesus. Antigone91 at <laughs> AOL.com. There's some shit in there. <laughs> Antigone? Back when I didn't know that word um, would tell you when your words are misspelled with a red squiggly ri- line, <laughs> I was writing someone and I'm like, I don't know why this red squiggly ri- line keeps popping up. <laughs> Wait, what does Antigone mean? It's oh, it's from a book. It's a Greek, oh. Greek oh, literature. Of course. Is that sexual, that Antigone? Um, <laughs> There's something sexual going on there, I'm sure. I think there is a sex scene, but oh I just oh. was really taken with I've, it. What, a sex scene? Like in mythology? Or yeah, in, in the book? literature. Yeah, oh. it's a story. Oh. oh. Here, let me pull it up. It's oh. Kind of you know I love lit. I can't I, you help love it. it. You love it's lit. lit. You can't help it. You love lit. And you can't help it. There's some song with the lyric. Her, oh. <laughs> Is it by Lit? I was just about to go. There's some song with the lyric has her nose in a book and I realize it's from Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> There's some hard hitting song about a girl <laughs> whose nose is already in a, a book. A provincial town. <laughs> Books. Just a small town she bell. She won't discover that it's him until chapter three. Exactly. You know the lyric. <laughs> Ooh, what are you talking about? Is Latinx what you want to use? You know, we had that guy email and then I looked at it and I just want to make sure. Somebody emailed about Latinx? Yeah, it was a mean email. So it was like, I didn't know. How oh, was it the guy who was mad at me? Yeah. So I just oh, want to no, make sure he's a it fool. is. No, that it's because Spanish is a gendered language. Gender neutral. Okay. And so the X takes away O or A, which okay. gives the gender. Just want to make no, sure. No, that guy can eat my dick. Josh didn't look at that. Huh? Fuck. Gutsy. <laughs> Fill your guts, but not in the gross sex way. Uh, wow. I know. I now knew. No. Like, no matter what, changing, pooping, everything. Yeah. There was this <gasps> bath. Fuck. There was a bathroom at camp that had two toilets. <laughs> and we would go in there often. <laughs> Play battle shits. He's a little too oh, famous. It- Make sure to cut that out. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. He's famous? <laughs> I mean, he's, he's up there. And he's- you sucked his dick? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Long, thin, is that a bad combo? It's not my favorite combo. Yeah. I'd rather have short and stout. Yeah, you, know? you want it to, yeah. Because yeah, it's we about... don't have like an endless tunnel. Yeah, it's about filling the pothole, not exactly. digging to China. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production. Written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough. Edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. 
You can find us on all of the socials. And for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok. And you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>